Today's Easter. He is risen. This is the greatest and most glorious moment in world history. It's as much of a miracle as the one before it, which is creation. Curtis and I have had that conversation a lot. First greatest miracle is creation. Second greatest miracle was Jesus Christ resurrecting from the dead. Our resurrection of our Lord is what gives us our faith, our hope, the reason why we believe, the reason why we're gathered today. It's because of the resurrection. It's the cross, the resurrection together. The cross doesn't mean anything without the resurrection. Nothing. We're going to read from Mark chapter 16. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn there. If not, you're okay. It'll be on the screen behind me or for those watching at home. However, I'm going to ask you to stand with your Bibles because we are all going to stand a reading of God's, for the God, uh, reading of God's word this morning. Man, I've been up way too early and I didn't even have that much caffeine. <laughs> yes, I did. Mark 16, one through eight. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Praise God for the reading of his word. You may be seated. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we humble ourselves before your throne of mercy. Lord God, we ask that you would pierce our soul today with your words. We pray, Lord God, that your spirit would go before us on this day and we would understand with more clear definition and complete clarity of your scripture so that you would write your words upon our hearts and we would never forget them as we go on forward from this day. Lord God, I pray that I remove myself my humanness from this pulpit to not get in the way of your message going forward. We praise you. We thank you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. A few years ago when some supposed archaeologists and scholars and journalists um, said they had discovered the tomb of Jesus, they said that inside of this tomb, they found his bones. <coughs> it caused quite a stir for millions of viewers. Oh my goodness. They found the bones of Jesus, is what they said. They suggested that discovery, though, should not be disturbing to Christians. The fact that his bones are still in the grave shouldn't take anything away from the experience, since it was really a soul that rose and gave us life in Christianity. Obviously, this is bad history. This is bad theology. And it turned out to be bad archaeology and journalism because they made it up for ratings. But this isn't surprising because denying the resurrection has been a major enterprise for Satan for 2,000 years now. Attempts have continually been made and endeavors uh, undertaken to dismiss the amazing moment of history as simply a fairy tale. Think nothing further, you guys. And I will tell you now, if you look in the bulletin, you know how I feel about talking politics, so I'm not doing that. But no matter how far to the right you are, you know that we have in our bulletin praying for Laura Kelly and President Biden, because they're 
doesn't matter what political party they're for. We should be praying for our leaders because they do represent us. However, on Friday, March 31st was declared as some sort of visibility day for trans people. He claimed it for this day on Sunday, which happens to be the day we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Stand down, Satan. This is, this is our Lord's day, man. This is the day we celebrate. That's what I, I'm not going to let that overshadow this. The point is, you guys, is there's always going to be things that try to overshadow our Lord. But he will never be overshadowed. He'll never be overtaken. Unfortunately, most people, though, that celebrate Easter are kind of lukewarm to the topic anyway of, of the resurrection. They're either content to accept the fact that maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. For some people... It has a sentimental value. It has something to do with whether or not they don't really want to argue whether or not it happened. But as long as it's a recognized holiday and you know, we can have some food, bunnies, chocolate, Easter eggs, things like that. Look, in all actuality, this moment in history, no matter what date we celebrate it on, will always be a commemoration of the greatest event that ever took place. That's why the date moves. We'll explain that another time, not today. The point is we are celebrating the resurrection, which fulfills the purpose of the Passover celebration of the Jews. And we're not celebrating a pagan holiday. That's why I say happy resurrection day. Amen. The Lord... And what he has done is life-changing. So no matter where people land on their pessimism about this event, here's what we do know. All four Gospels corroborate the exact same story about the resurrection, and they didn't get together to put the story together. And it's not just these four accounts that claim it. We also have eyewitness accounts to the majesty of the miracle itself. Although... Um, I will tell you, I have spent a great deal of time researching this because I, if you cut me, I bleed apologetics. I love to talk about the truths found in Scripture and the truths found outside of Scripture in order to defend the Scripture. Not that the Scripture needs defending. I just like arguing with people to prove them wrong because I know that Jesus is right. <laughs> but there's a way to do it. We do it in gentleness and respect, but seriously, when people bring up something and they bring up something hokey and they ask me questions about it, I want to be able to answer them. So therefore, I've read the accounts of Josephus, who was a Jewish non-Christian historian. I've also read the Roman Gentile uh, chronicles, which explain some of the things that they saw and what they experienced that corroborate what the gospels are actually saying. And no, they're not propelling, the, those two other sources are not propelling the, the truth in Christ. They're simply stating, we don't know where the body went. In other words, the body was gone. The reason why we are Christians is because of this event. For if Jesus had only died and not raised himself from the dead, we would, of all people, Paul says, would be the most to be pitied for following him. He would just be like the other 30,000 people who died on a cross. The reason why his has such a resonating point is because he told everybody he would be dying and he told everybody he would be rising, and that's that. But to do due diligence, to do our due diligence, we need to read through some things. Our Savior, who in fact raised himself from the dead, this isn't because we choose to believe this. This is because it's a truth of Christ that permeates the person who repents and believes in the need for a Savior, and then he takes up residence within those who confess the truth of Christ from their lips and believe in, heart, in their heart that he died and rose again. And from that point forward, he takes up residence. So this has not only supernatural implications, this points to the fact that this is a supernatural event. And it's because of this that we have our hope in the one who never fails and the one who never fails at even delivering his promises. This is the case for the resurrection. I want to begin by restating verse 8. And they went out 
and fled from the tomb. Mark 8, 16, 8. <coughs> Thank you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, excuse me, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they had said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Why would anybody be afraid unless somebody made them afraid? You can take that down. Please. You aren't terrified unless something makes you terrified. And Jesus said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. He's the one in the white robe. He's the one speaking to them. The greatest words ever uttered by our Lord and Savior, he is not here. He has risen indeed. Now the angel had rolled away the stone. Jesus was gone. The grave clothes were there and the resurrection had taken place. And this morning I'm going to share eight reasons Eight reasons. I'm getting some feedback on the stage. Could you please cut back the monitors? Thank you. Um, these are built in the solidarity of principal facts. Okay? Um, what matters is circumstance and proof. What matters most is the word of God and the fact that the word of God proves himself. So now I told you I bled apologetics. I believe because he placed it here, and I know. Not because I know here, it's because I had heart surgery. By God, I know here. He changed this. He's changing this. But I'm going to talk to those people this morning who are on the fence about it. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, people. If you're one of those, I don't care to, for you to raise your hand. I want you to see eight things that I've seen too. And if you get done with this today and you still don't believe, we're still going to continue to pray for you. I want you to see what I've seen. I want you to see what we've all seen. Number one, Jesus himself testified to his coming resurrection from the dead. This is the first of the most important facts. Jesus spoke openly about what would happen to him. We are just finishing the book of Mark. And in the book of Mark, three times, thrice, Jesus stated that he was going to die and raise again. And his disciples did not understand what he meant. They never understood what he meant at the time. Because otherwise they would have what? Not been sad when he did die. Hey, hold on. Step back just to make sure this resonates with you. Guy, you're going in for foot surgery. I don't know, right? Right? And you've told me three times, I'm going to go in for surgery, and it's going to be fine. And then you go in the day of surgery, and you're home, and I come over, and I'm like, you had surgery? Are you going to be okay? Yeah, they just removed a bad toenail. Are you going to be fine? What, why didn't you talk to me? Literally, you would be like, what do you mean? I told you three times. We had this conversation. Were you not there? Jesus told them three times he was going to die and raise again a little bit bigger than a toenail getting removed. Amen, somebody. <laughs> but what happens here is that he dies, he raises again. And he says this in Mark 8, 31, where he says, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed after three days rise again. This is also recorded in Luke 9, 22 and Matthew 17, 22. Those who consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ unbelievable, will probably say that these guys were all deluded. They made it up. They convinced Jesus to do this story, and they all had a big acting gig going down here. Look, man, those who claim that our faith is a figment of foolish imagination will be unsatisfied with any effort to explain Christ's truth and his testimony to his resurrection from the dead. People who don't want to believe it aren't going to want to believe it. It takes a miracle, miracle in the act of God that the Holy Spirit would draw you to the Savior because he gave you that word. In the word of God, it says that he has chosen us out of this world. This is why we teach the gospel. 
This is why we preach the truth of the gospel. Because those of us who here who have believed, who have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, had to be told also about the saving message of Jesus Christ. You had to hear it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing from the words of Christ. You had to hear it. This is so important that Jesus testified about his coming resurrection after his death. Number two, the tomb was empty. On Sunday, the tomb was empty. The earliest documents claim in Luke 24, 20, and 24, 3, when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, the enemies of Jesus, Romans and Jews alike, confirmed it by claiming that the disciples had stolen the body. They said this in Matthew 28, 13. Saints, you don't attempt to hide evidence or cover something up unless you have no logical explanation for it. Amen? Amen. Truth is, the dead body of Jesus could not be found. There were four common claims here. A, his, his foes stole the body. Well, they never claimed this. Their explanation as to how th- up towards of 36 of their best officers, the guard. When you see the guard fell asleep, you see two guys outside the tomb. What's a platoon? A group of men or women, soldiers. A guard is like a platoon. Upwards of 36 of them Because this was single-handedly the biggest crucifixion in their history, and they wanted to shush everybody, you think they're going to put some chump skates on that guard duty watch? No, you're going to put your best soldiers on it. So, So think about this. 36 of their finest soldiers all fall asleep simultaneously. And let not one of them hear a big stone being rolled away from in front of the tomb. Okay. It doesn't take much logic to see that this is truth. And yet, people argue this all the time. B, his friend stole the body. They didn't steal the body. It was clearly they didn't even know that he was gone. And they didn't believe Mary Magdalene when she came and told him. Three... Or C, Jesus was not dead. Jesus was not dead. But only unconscious when they laid him in the tomb. <laughs> so this would mean he awoke, removed the stone from the inside, overcame the, all of the soldiers, vanished from thin air after appearing to a couple of the guys. Uh, no, he was obviously dead. And they knew that because they took the spear And they shoved it into his chest cavity where his heart was pierced and blood and water drained out. He's dead. Or number, or or option D. God raised Jesus from the dead. This is what he said would happen. It's what the disciples all said to happen. And as long as there is a remote possibility of explaining the resurrection naturalistically, many people will state that we should not jump to a supernatural conclusion. But really? How do you not jump to a, 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 rational, a, a rational supernatural conclusion? Some things happen that we cannot explain. It doesn't make them untrue. You know? We don't want to reject truth just because it's a strange story. We accept the truth because it's a beautiful story. Number three, the disciples were almost immediately transformed. This is a big one, you guys. Listen to this. Think about, okay. They're in a garden of Gethsemane. They come to arrest Jesus because Judas sells him out. Kisses the master. They know which one it is. They go right after him. Peter yanks out his sword, hacks off a centurion soldier, gets rebuked by Jesus, The centurion soldier gets healed instantaneously by Jesus. And they scatter. Fulfilling the scripture that said, strike the shepherd and the flock will scatter. It's exactly what happened. They fled. They were scared. 
So Peter tries to find, follow them where they, by the way, instead of going to a court the next day, they do this at night so that nobody sees it. And they take them all back to Caiaphas' house, the lead priest, to do his trial at the house, which was illegal and the only time it ever occurred in Jewish history. And they decide that they don't like Jesus and they want to take him up before the Romans council and Pontius Pilate to have him crucified. Meanwhile, they're beating on him. Off in the distance, Peter makes his way by a campfire so he can watch what's going on from afar. And a little girl says, you're with him, you know him. I don't, I don't know him. Not once, but twice that another dude calls him out and he says, nope, that's not me. Vehemently, here's the rooster crow for the second time, realizes that he did exactly what Jesus told him he was going to do. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. That Peter, that man, Acts 2, 22 through 24. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. To thousands of people at the colonnade just a couple of weeks after saying, I don't know him. That's transformation. You killed him. You crucified him. Thousands of people come to faith faith saving knowledge of Jesus Christ at that moment because of Peter you don't go from chump to champion in a couple of days that's enough for me to believe single handedly Acts 3 14 and 15 but you denied the holy righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And I say more. Witnesses. If you have a witness to a crime. And it's legit. The person who did the crime goes to jail. At least they go to trial. Credibility of the witnesses or witness has a lot to do with incriminating that person, whether or not they get charged to go to jail. These guys were witnesses, and you could see it in them. Look no further than Acts 4, 1 through 4. And as they were speaking to the people, that is Peter and John, <coughs> pardon me, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, because they were preaching the gospel, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. We're going to arrest you if you don't stop talking about Jesus. Bet. Here's my hands. You mean to put them on too? What, 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 what else you got? Well, we need you to stop talking about him. We're going to stop talking about him. We're going, you're going to have to kill us. They did that because they knew who they served. I've said this before, but one of my, great, one of my greatest um, shares, I think, of something I heard from Chuck Colson, the Watergate scandal had happened, and there were 12 men, and they all had conspired together that they were going to, Defend the honor of what they did, no matter what. In 12 hours, all 12 of them broke. In 12 hours, all 12 of them broke silence and admitted that they were covering up a crime. You have the disciples who died 
to attest for the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Saul becomes Paul. He's on a mission before this, though, before he becomes Paul. His name is Saul of Tarsus, and he's got a mission. And his mission is to go and serve papers and arrest people who believe in Jesus Christ. He is annoyed with Christians. He doesn't like this conversion. He's what we call the super Jew. He's after them. He's going to arrest them and, and put them up in prison and have them killed, whatever he could. He cannot stand these people. It's an abomination to the law of, 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 of Moses. And, and he's after them. And on the way to Damascus, Jesus appears to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? And after that, everything changes for him. Probably one of the most compelling arguments in my estimation is the transformation of Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle. You can read about it in the book of Acts. He was given a mission to hunt them down, and yet he was turned and became so badly that when he was walked up uh, to, to meet some of the disciples, they saw him, knew who he was, and started tripping out as to why they're letting him in. Like, uh, really? You're going to bring him in here? You know that he is, he's after us. They're bringing him. This is like espionage. This is spy work. And you're really going to let him in here? Hear what the man has to say. Don't judge him. They hear his testimony. And they know it's Jesus that does it to them. You ever have a clubhouse when you were a kid? No girls allowed? Come on, fellas. No girls allowed? You ain't no girls allowed. Not unless they were really hot. That's when you were a teenager, come on, somebody. It was funny. But no, nobody, nobody allowed. We had a pact, us guys had a pact that no girls were allowed. I don't care how cute they were, they were not allowed. Then you have a guy try to convince us that a girl was allowed into the clubhouse. Or girls, you did the same thing with stinky, nasty boys. And they're still stinky and nasty. Amen, all girls. <laughs> right? You have this little cute pact and you're not going to let them in. Now you think that it, what I'm telling you about Saul of Tarsus being allowed into the fold by the disciples is a huge stretch of the imagination. No, it's not. It's because they were convinced after they heard his story when he told them what happened. Because he spoke from here. And we know a brother or sister in Christ. I think no further than brother Jared and, and, and sister uh, Grace in Kenya, man. Whenever we're talking, we have this, I don't know them. I've never met them in person. But we just have this connection when we talk. When we do our Bible study, we connect. When we pray, we connect. When we're teaching, we connect. Because we know we're drawn together by the same Holy Spirit from God. It doesn't matter if they're in China or South Korea or South America or any part of Africa. We know this, that the same spirit of God is within all of us, brothers and sisters, that we are the worldwide church. Number five. Oh, Sierra, I'm going to read a 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of, all who are still, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Paul used this argument to explain to people who did not believe that Jesus had appeared to the, had really resurrected, that he went out on a limb. It is his testimonial that he not only claimed to see the risen Christ, but knew that many had seen Jesus Christ. Number five, the early church flourished. This is really important. The church spread over the power of the testimony of Jesus by those uh, who believed and saw the risen Savior. And then those who believed, those who had, come on, I'm going to go practical apologetics with you here. How many of you love a story that your dad or mom told you that you weren't there to see? Every one of us. We all listen to stories that were told to us by somebody who was there, and you believe it so much that you tell 20 people about it over your lifetime. I got a friend of mine. You know what my dad did once? You weren't there. You don't know. You believe the credibility of the person giving the testimony. That's how the gospel spread. Gage came walking up to me, said, I saw Jesus, and he's got passion in his eyes, and he's crying. He goes, I saw him, and I know him. I'm going to believe him. Or if Nick did it, 
or if Jacob did it, or if any one of you came up and shared something exquisite, I would believe you. If you told me you saw the risen Christ, I would really have a hard time with that, only because we don't need to see him now. He only appeared once for all. We believe in that. That is the truth that sets us free, and we know he's coming back again. But if you come up compelled to share something with me, I'm going to listen to you and believe that you are going through such an experience. Amen. So we don't need to have to make this appeal as to why the early church flourished. Number six, the appearance to only women. First century Palestine. Women, cover your head and shush. That this is the truth of Palestine in first century, amen? Look, women are not given any kind of credibility. None whatsoever. So why would he appear to a woman as the first person to see him resurrected? Because Jesus does everything differently. Jesus can do what he wants. And I think what's beautiful about this, note again that placing Mary Magdalene as a witness to the resurrection testifies to the historicity of the event. If the author invented the miracle, if the author invented the miracle of a resurrection, he would never have made a woman a witness to the resurrection because the testimony of, wisdom, uh, of women here was never going to be credible. Introducing it would have made the story seem more unlikely. But if you are writing history, you include all of the facts, even if they are not culturally acceptable. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He wrote that in the story that way. End of story. Mic drop, Jesus. Number seven, the New Testament witnesses do not bear a stamp of idiots. <clears throat> If a four-year-old comes up to me and tells me a story about a big horned monster walking around in the backyard, I'm going to ask them if they have, first I'm going to check to see if they have a fever. Second of all, I'm going to figure they're making up a story because they're four years old and they have an imagination. Okay. Curtis walks up to you and says, I need to talk to you about something that's really important. And he shares something with you. You're going to believe him. Because you've heard Curtis talk and you, you can feel when he delivers a message that he's speaking from the spirit of God. He's also credible enough to know he hasn't been thrown out of a school for teaching kids. So we know that he's got that going for him. <laughs> Amen. You mark the testimony of a human's uh, uh, pre presentation by the credibility that they've already endeared to you. That's how we know. God's not going to make the, uh, the, the almost 600 people who were eyewitnesses to the resurrection be a bunch of four-year-olds with imaginations. However, it's not to say that kids don't hide. God doesn't hide the, the majesties of heaven within children because he does. Bible tells us that. That's why I love little kids and they say some of the funniest stuff. And I'm like, man... I love, I love being in this building with jars of clay down the hallway. Uh, at first, I remember when I came to the pastor, I thought, man, they're all really noisy. What am I doing in here? I got to shut my door. Uh, now my door is always flung wide open, and it's white noise. I got to hear all the, the kids down the hallway, um, the teachers. You know, I got to hear it all. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just, it's satisfying to me. And when I get to see one, and a uh, little uh, a one and a half year old, ran up to me again the other day and just ran up to me, left her teacher's arms and runs up to me and puts her arms up for me to give her a hug. And it's like, God, God blessed children and God blessed us with children. And it doesn't matter who they are, or where they come from, they're to be loved and watched over by all of us. We have a responsibility, church. And I love that about him. And Brooks opened the door for all of the family today when he walked up to the door. He's like, I'm strong enough, I got it. And then he opened the door and he waited for me to let the other person behind their family walk through. And I go, I figured he gave up by the time. Nope, he's still sitting there. I got it. Come on, man. Today's good. You know, he didn't. He didn't even get frustrated with me. And I walked through and I go, well, thanks, buddy. He goes, you're welcome. And then walks right into the church. I love children. God gave this testimony, this narrative of seeing something to maybe some children but certainly some credible adults. And a lot more of them are the ones who saw the resurrection. No matter who he gave it to, I believe anybody who saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what we stand on today. It's the truth we stand on today. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6, in their case, 
Paul says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servant for Christ, for Jesus' sake. And for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the knowledge of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This would mark our eighth and final one. There is a self-authenticating glory in the gospel of Christ's death and resurrection as narrated by the biblical witnesses. It's a long one. Authenticated death and resurrection as narrated by biblical witnesses. You're not going to ruin your reputation. Someone steals your credit card number. You're all mad that you're going to get your reputation ruined. Your neighbor says some smack to another neighbor and you're talking about suing them for defamation because you're not going to have your personality taking over the coals. But you're going to go out and say that you saw a resurrected Christ in order to not take heat unless you believe it because you saw it. Saints have a saving knowledge of Christ crucified and risen is not the mere result of right reasoning about historical facts. It's the result of spiritual illumination from God by giving you the knowledge right here. He starts with heart surgery and it trails up to our brain and our brains are transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's what Romans 12 2 says. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to have your heart surrender to Christ first and then your mind follows suit. And you don't jump on the religious bandwagon. You let God change you little bit by little bit because you trust in him. Your life is not perfect. And if you crawled in here today and you told me that your life was perfect in every way, shape, and form, two things. One is, where's your book? And two, you lie and your breath stank. Nobody's life is perfect. We need him. My life is not perfect, but boy, it's content, and I have joy and peace and, and contentment because of him. Him who died and, ri and rose again, he is my savior. I believe nothing more than the truth that which transformed my life and is continuing. It's a progressive transformation. You don't gut a fish before you catch it, do you? Do you take a shower in order to take a bath? You jump in dirty, just as you are, and you trust in him who will change your life. There is no greater love than the one of the Savior who laid down his life for his friends. Amen, guy. And then raised himself up again for his friends. There's no greater realization than this love to know that he calls you his friend. And what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. Our prayer is that you turn your lives around to him. And I want to say this. On Friday, on Friday, dead. And on Sunday, not dead. He's risen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you. We humble ourselves before your throne of mercy. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would just continue to change our lives. Continue to change our focus. Continue to draw us closer together with you. Our lives are never or will never be content apart from you. Lord, we don't always know what this looks like. We don't always understand what this is supposed to be like. But we do know this, that if we just trust in you today, things will change. But we've got to put in the effort. You're a sovereign, mighty God. You do miracle work all the time. But we've got to put in our effort. May today we surrender unto you. I pray for every soul that's in here today, Lord God, for the brothers and sisters who have repented and believe and love you, to the ones who are still on the fence about it. 
We pray for each person here because we are the church family and that's our duty. Not one person here is nastier than another. We're all nasty the same. Last time I checked, Lord God, sin is sin. We're going to give it all to you and put it at the foot of your cross and ask you, Lord God, through your victory of the resurrection, that you would take away our, in, our, our sin stain and our inability to, to justify ourselves and make us new creations in you. For Jesus, you are our hope. You are the life. You are the truth. You are the hope. You are the resurrection. Give you, giving you all the glory today that we will do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.